Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. All right, friends, before we get started, I want to shout out a very special Etsy store, Meraki Made Products. This is a store put together by a friend of mine, local to Minnesota. Um, He makes some cool gaming supplies. One of them is a measuring snake. The measuring snake uses magnetic one-inch increments that you can snap together, plus an end piece that is for specific models. So, for example, you can use a 32 millimeter end cap Um, Plus the base of the model equals two inches and then you can measure front to back. It's just like a magnetic bendy ruler and it's super cool and I highly recommend checking it out. There will be a link in the show notes. In this week's episode, we interview Alexander from Texas who recently won a golden ticket playing the Far Stalker Kin Band. That's right, Crute winning a golden ticket. Um, We kick it off with a live reaction showing off one of our latest Instagram reels in collaboration with Mob Hammer. Here it is. All right, Alexander, we're going to... We just... I just teamed up with uh, YouTube content creator Mob Hammer 40K, and we shot a little set... We shot a couple shorts, but this is the first one. I just wanted to get your live reaction since it just came out this morning. This will be the video. All right, three, two, one. Kill Team Tactical Ploys, Brood Brothers. In this game, we're watching Phobos versus the newest rules of the GSC's Brood Brothers. In this scenario, we see a Phobos mine layer spend its activation shooting at the Patriarch and placing a proximity mine. At the end of their opponent's activation, the Gene Stealer Medic uses Insidious to move up within coverage range of the Brood Brother veteran. Patriarch is activated next, generating two APL. They move within range of the mine, trigger the mine, and then the veteran with its bodyguard ability can use unquestioning loyalty for zero CP, taking the damage in place of the Patriarch. This can be resolved in a few ways, either with a Brood Brother veteran's death or survival, depending on roles as well as the medic's involvement. Regardless of this gamble, the Patriarch is able to finish their move unimpeded and take out the Phobos Intercessor. Thoughts? Wow. So love the video. I think all the the graphics on top of it look really clean. Um, now the actual tactical part that that's like a that's a power play right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I'm not tr- I'm not too familiar with all that the Brood Brothers can do, but if that's just like a hint of the power, I think they're gonna be strong contenders. It's a good it's a good set of positional play that you can basically math out with the medic covering for unquestioning loyalty. And because the Brood Brother veteran can do it for free, you could just you could just do it, which is very neat. But your experience is mostly around the Crute, right? The Far Soccer Kinban. You've been playing them for the last two years since we last met at Kill Team Open, you know, two years ago. Yeah, so way back then I was still I was running uh Legionaries and I was just waiting for the crew box to come out and then once they came out i was fully on board and that was when crew were hitting on fours yeah hitting on fours was definitely not the brightest moment for the crew they had cool rules but clearly they needed a lot of help at that time period because hitting on fours meant they were not good against anything especially against elites Man, I, f- I totally forgot about the period that Kroot hit on fours. Dark times. Hit on fours with 11 operatives. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. One less operative, too. So what made you want to push through the rough period on the Kroot? Because that period was very rough. I think I tried them maybe two games. And even as a first-time Kroot lover from the edition drop, I just, this, I'm not playing this right now. They are not good enough. They will break my soul. Yeah, it's, it's totally a good question. Uh, I, I don't know what I was thinking back then, uh, hitting on fours. Um, I, I think the thing that really drew me to them is the way that they like to play the game. Um, the way that I've described it to everybody is they don't really care about playing the opponent. They just want to play the game. Lou and secure is like their bread and their bread and butter. Um, 
and that that's where I like to focus focus on with that team is just how to be in positions where I can just take advantage of objectives. You know, what are the tools that Kroot have that are unique to them that allow them to play loot and secure, but not capture quite as well? Because they do have a huge array of tools. It's just a lot of the tools maybe are not as reliable as something like Kasserkin or Pathfinder. So talk us through a little bit about your strategic level thoughts when building out a play for your Kroot. Yeah, so I, I like to play them a, lo- a little more defensively, a little more passively. If it's into the dark, I don't want to be the one opening doors. And if I have to, it's not till turning point three. Um, that sort of thing. The tool that really comes in clutch is a uh, poach for one action point. Just step onto the objective. Doesn't matter if they have 20 APL on it. I can just take it for free. Um, and loot, it's a little harder because it might have already been taken. Um, but if if we're firefighting and we're and we're, people are just uh, getting kills off, it might be later in the turn that that loot objective st- is is open. And then secure, it might be the last operative. I'm going to throw a warrior up there. I don't care about him, and his whole job is just to take the objective right from underneath somebody's toes. Yeah, and with poach. Um, and loot like people could easily just not think about it and then like be like oh I've got way more APL than you I don't need to worry about this just yet and then you can just have like one model versus two space marines just yoink it real quick yeah and if, if that's the situation that's that hurts an elite team for sure uh, not only do they always take any consideration is anybody on my team besides the dog can do it and if they're not addressing it early um, I get to play my defensive game uh, which is totally fine because I'm, I'm in a position of, uh, I don't want to say like a win-win, but uh, it's advantageous for me if they're focusing on looting and I can focus on staying on my objective. And then um, if it's turning point three or turning point four where I finally get a poach off, that's a 4-2 turn. Yeah. Are you using the balance of books secondary attack op so that you can play your objectives safely and just kind of like hide on the mid at the mid-range? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the most common ploy that, you, that people take is going to be balance the books, uh, recover item, and implant. Um, depending on the type of opponent that I'm playing, uh, depending on his team, I might need to be changing that up. Everybody sees it coming, and so if you're able to like do uh, just like uh, trick them into thinking that's what you're taking, and then one one of the ones that I like to think about is seize defenses, which barricades sometimes people aren't really thinking and that's not a very common uh tack on it just comes out of nowhere and i'm just scoring those points um uh, so yeah so i t- i like love balance the book i think recover item is probably the one of the easiest ways to get points on that team that dog is just 11 inches move dash free pickup item um it's very yeah very strong so your defensive line is basically trying to go for an even split and just winning your six points on tack offs by being somewhat non-interactive. And then if your opponent basically realizes what's happening and has to take the first play, you have lots of counterpunching tools. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about what those counterpunching tools and how you punish your opponents outside of poach? Because obviously yeah, yeah. poach being used to steal an objective that your opponent isn't thinking about what because they have more APL is really powerful. But there are other tools that the crew have. So I'm sure for anyone struggling on crew, you know, they'd probably like to know. Yeah. So the uh, the crew are I like to call them jack of all trades. They're really good at a lot of different things. Um, and where they excel is sort of having that spread. Um, they got four key operatives when it comes to doing that counter punch. Um, you have the pistolier, you got the archer, you have uh, the heavy gunner, um, you take the skinner. I haven't found a, a situation where the other gun comes into play. I bring it just in case. And then the sniper, which I think is the best sniper in the game outside of the Justian sniper. Um, if a, a lot of a lot of players are going to try to get some shots off, it's very hard to just keep all of my guys safe considering the deployment zone. If there's only one piece of heavy terrain, I have to sacrifice somebody. And if somebody is willing to take that shot, I'm totally fine losing a warrior. 
but it's going to be a one for one trade because my sniper is going to be in a position where he can just move, uh, quickly dash, turn on his uh, silent lethal five up, uh, ignore obscuring, and taking that shot. It does require a third APL, but you got a comms and you got Grizzly Trophy. So those are tools to really help mobilize your units that you need to move um, in that situation. Um, since we're 12 activations, very few teams are going to out uh, activate us or be on par with us. So I can save my archer or my sniper very last. Um, I love the heavy gunner. Six attacks hitting on two, two, three damage. Um, AP two, very scary. Um, however, everybody else understands that he's a super huge threat that if they don't take out, they're going to lose a guy too. Um, so I sort of treat him as sacrificial in a way if i get to do his thing i'm happy if he dies and was the only casualty i'm perfectly fine because my other threats are the ones that i focus on that makes a lot of sense to me um yeah in general it's i think it is just a really good plan to have a piece that you're willing to trade that is like seems like a really good deal for your opponent and then like what you get out of the trade ends up being a big bonus yeah that's exactly my line of thought i love the gunner and he <laughs> i'm more than happy to throw him under the bus He's got a job to do. If he can get the dude and force your opponent to react to him, that's probably good enough. If you can have him have a trophy, do a move, shoot, move, and then your opponent has to swing around a bunch of models to have to cut cover lines and go blow him up, it's probably not actually the worst trade at the end of the day. Yeah. I got I got bodies to spare. I'm playing the long game. And <clears throat> losing him, perfectly fine. Somebody else will come up and take his place. So how often do opponents end up switching gears and going on a killing spree because Kroot, you know, balance of books, very powerful. It just turns on your other two tech ops if you can finish them, but you do need to keep six or more operatives alive. Have people realized that they need to be focusing on trying to remove your operatives and how have you reacted to people changing plans? Yeah. So the, the reason why balance the books pairs up nicely with implant and recover item is recover item. You can get uh, at the end of turning point two. You, should have, you shouldn't lose that many operatives by then, so that's a guaranteed three points. Um, <clears throat> implant is easier to do. Not, not easier than a recover item, but easier than most because you can do it on your own terms. I can sacrifice a guy um, to get my last parry off on... I can do it within turning point two as well, so that's the big key there is getting it done before turning point two. Every other tag op, I found it to be a lot more difficult to be able to do that. And that's where I see the gear start turning of like, I got to stop this guy by taking out some units. And that's where I feel the pressure. Um, I don't really like to have to switch tag ops. But if, I, <clears throat> but if I'm choosing one, it's because I know it's something that I can do safely. Um, and the ones that are... You're, you're oh, playing like an asymmetric game plan where you have your plan and you're just trying to play that plan and if your opponent has to figure out a way to interact with you all the better because when they come out and overextend you can counter punch it, exactly um so and it's yeah it's worked out pretty well for you so far you know i've been writing for goonhammer i've seen your name pop up in all of the <laughs> large texas tournaments you know last year i think you were top three for the lone star open this year you were it, you were just under the top eight, I think, in the top of the second bracket. Yeah, top I think of the last second. weekend or two weekends ago, you won a golden ticket to the World Championships. So, are you planning to be the bird boy at the World Champs, representing if, the Lone Star State? If there's a if there's a team that I'm taking, it's going to be the crew. I thought about taking other teams. Night Lords feels like my style, um, but then I, I thought I was going to bring Night Lords to the Dallas Open. Uh, they're cool, they're new, they're fun. Um, didn't paint, get them painted in time. So I took the crew, and I realized I perform well with them. I should probably stick with them. So, that yeah, that, you'll see crew at the World Champs. I'm excited to see that. 
what matchup spread do you feel like they have? Because obviously, I've played Crew a little bit in the past. I've written about them on Goonhammer. I think that in the past, I found that the elite matchups can be somewhat hard. I believe that the last FAQ or the last data slate did give them a pretty sizable buff when dealing with the elites because now you can get p1 on your shooting attacks which means that you can re- reliably chip down opposing elites especially with vengeance for the kin band on what do you think like the matchup spread looks like i know in the past commandos have been very hard for the team to be beat but with the changes maybe they're not quite as deadly as they used to be yeah um the matchups that i really love playing against happen to be the elite team phobos are a little scarier because uh, they have a lot more shooting shenanigans um, and can reliably take me an eight wound model down. Um, not saying that the other elites can't, but I have, I think I have better tools to fight against those other elite teams. Um, teams that I probably am more, a little more intimidated of, um, are Felgor and Gellerpox. Um, the reason being for Felgor, they do a lot of damage on their charge. I, I don't think I can actually reliably take them out on my own charge. And then if that's the case, I have to do it all over again. Once they frenzy, um, we have damage output, but I don't think it's going to be that much to take out, uh, what seems to be 20 operatives. Um, and then on the other side for Geller pox, um, in, in, with feel no pains, it's, it, it's hard because I can make maybe get 12 damage through. And at the end of the day, they're only taking four. Um, so that's that unknown is just a little bit hard to uh, to counter punch against because uh, once they're in, they're going to be in. And my whole plan can get very easily disrupted. And it's really just the large wound count and the injury bubbles that mean that even in melee, you're not very reliable. And in shooting, eh, shooting's okay, but it's not going to take down 18 wounds with a 5-up feel no pain and a 5-up save. Yeah, the the models that, the two models that are going to do it are going to be the the sniper and the, the bow. Um, I, I've, I, I've rolled four crits on my, on my sniper before, and that's a lot of damage. And it wasn't a feel no pain operative, the one game that I did that with, and it did not die. Uh, so that was very frustrating to see on a, such a good roll. Yeah, the Gellerpox 5 up and 5 up feel no pain. I've definitely seen it do some work at the World Championships and elsewhere. Yeah. So you know that Orion is probably going to play Gellerpox, so be on the watch out. Oh, and I'm counting on it. Um, <clears throat> the hard part is a lot. Not a lot of people in our meta play those two teams, so it's harder to 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 prepare for that sort of thing. Uh, our local meta is a lot of elf teams, Hyrotech, um, and just a mix of some uh, Imperium teams. So great, great players here. Uh, Hyrotech and Mandrakes are definitely uh, um, fun matchups. They're difficult, and I pr- I love the challenge. But it's rough. You know, speaking about this local meta, you know, you're part of the Texas scene. Tell us a little bit about the area that you play. You know, which stores do you frequent? And how many people are you guys getting? Because, you know, you're not a TO like we've had in the past on the show. But, you know, you are a player and you're one of, probably one of the more respective players, you know, especially now with uh, the gold ticket in your hand and all of these pretty solid tournament performances throughout the last couple of years. So tell us a little bit about Texas. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with Texas, Texas is pretty great. Um, out, so outside of uh, Kill Team, we got a lot of great things going on here. And then specifically for Kill Team, I'm in San Antonio and we have a huge scene out here and we've been growing for the last last two years um we we have two stores that give us a lot of support we have uh dragon's lair at alamo ranch and we have hole in the wall hobbies both the great stores both teams both stores love supporting us and we're actually having an event next week uh very small very local um but on average between at dragon's lair we get roughly six to 12 people every thursday and our record which just got broken two weeks ago we had 19 people in store 
a hole in the wall. Uh, it's on the opposite side of town. It's it's newer. They recently started supporting us, and we probably get about uh, four to eight people every Tuesday. Um, but the most that they've had is twelve uh, for a special event that they uh, did on a Saturday. Um, so we have a really vibrant community, and we have a lot of actually talented players in San Antonio too. They place um, the top eight, and we had when we went to Clutch City in Houston, we had four up, uh, four of actually all five of us I think placed in the top eight that went. Um, and so we have some, yeah we have some great players, uh, and then across the across the state we've done a lot of collaboration with houston austin and dallas we are sort of a really tight-knit community everybody seems to know each other and encourage play um at, or at least attendance in the tournaments um i think it's a very healthy state um and considering we have a lot of golden tip- ticket opportunities in, in our state alone uh we had one well, one in February, we just had the last, we had two this month, and we're going to have the Lone Star open in July. Nice. <clears throat> Who's running that tournament? Is it Chase or James Grubbs or which which one of the regional TOs? Uh, I, th- I think that one's going to be Chase. So, okay, nice. super yeah, cool Chase guy. Been... I know he's been on the show. <laughs> yeah, he's been on the podcast for one forever ago, you know, in the first year. So if anyone's interested in seeing what the college town scene is like, that's uh, in our year one podcast. Yeah. So su- I would say a super great group of people we-, we have in Texas. It's a very fun community here. Yeah. So, you know, you've got plenty of crude experience. Texas sounds like it's been popping off. Have there been other teams that you've been eyeing? You, I know you mentioned Nemesis Claw, or do you really just practice crude and get a chance to play? And that's like mostly what you have time for. Yeah, so I don't have a, I don't get a lot of time to actually like play. Uh, I help support these two nights, and it does take a lot of a uh, sort of promotion to get uh, pe- to get people out to. Run, um, to run our little events and to run through our narrative stuff, um, but I really, I, I, I practice crew, but I want a lot of our our players to get fresh experiences. They they all they all know what it's like to experience crew over and over again. Uh, it's a little less fun <laughs> for them at that point. So I bring out other teams. I've been playing around with some Geller Pox. Um, I been doing a nemesis claw since they came out as well and we're about to start our narrative campaign and it looks like i'm running inquisition i have to get my roster submitted today and i still don't know what i'm taking um but i'm looking forward to playing them um but i i think my my eyes are going to stay on the prize for for crew uh at least for the competitive scene i think i just they're 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 my style i love the tricks that they have and I think Nemesis Claw sort of complements that. I really like the tricks that Nemesis Claw does. I've been having loads of fun playing that team. Yeah, Nemesis Claw is really cool. And uh, the fact that in Midnight Clad was recently fixed to become Super Conceal as well is amazing. I love that. Um, what's your What's your favorite? Do you have like a favorite play or a favorite operative for Nemesis Claw? Let's see. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I I think they're all pretty even in my book. If I had to choose one, I think it's got to be. I think it's got to be the mini butcher, the skin thief. I, I, I uh, when I played legionaries, I was a big proponent. I was a big advocate for the butcher. I believed in him. Um, while everybody in the everybody in my town was just like, "Nah, butcher sucks," I was right there saying, "But I love the butcher." And so, this <clears throat> he's not quite butcher status, but uh, he he has a we special place for me. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't let you down as much as the butcher does, does he? <laughs> <laughs> this one's a lot more reliable. I love what he can do. Yeah. I think it's it's been interesting to see the first season of design where. Four attacks on fours or threes or through relentless sounds really good on paper. 
it's not great. <laughs> They'll let you down. They always let you down in an eight round tournament series. Yeah, and that's a. I, I love legionaries, but uh, ha- having a butcher fail more than once is it, it hurts. <laughs> yeah, that four attacks on four, even is it's like. If it was unconditionally relentless, it'd be, like, a little better, but it's, like, only when you charge, and then, like, when he does fail, it's, like, he's one out of six. So, like, uh, you know, if if it was, like, bl- if blooded, if the blooded butcher worked that way, it wouldn't be such a loss. But for Legionary, it is it is huge if yeah. he does not do what he's supposed to do. Um, that and being he, said, I'm a huge fan of the butcher, too. I always make yeah. him Mark of Corn, and then I kind of, like, slightly doom guy him, where I'll give him the Grizzly Trophy and a Malefic Blade. And then uh, he's he's a big flex choice. And then, like, it's way less likely that he completely flops. Like, if someone attacks him, you can parry him out with a knife. And if he attacks, he's rerolling everything and he just needs a single hit. And he'll upgrade it to a crit and you can make that even an eight damage hit. So for anyone else out there that is interested in the Butcher, not all hope is lost. It works pretty well. Just 50% of your equipment points. Yeah, but, you know, like, what else are you going to do? Take that terrible armor that breaks... The first time you get hit, <laughs> garbage. You could give him tainted rounds at this point too, Jason. Just, just make him go all the way. Give him a four or five bolt pistol. Here we go. <laughs> I honestly don't hate that. <laughs> Anyways, the skin thief. He's he's much better than the butcher. He 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 looks visually the visual design language of the model very similar to the butcher, but because he's got five attacks on threes, four six, reap one, and rending, just far more reliable that extra attack means that when he goes into melee he's generally going to get the job done and when he does it he's got a nice nice big little bonus right oh it's huge uh i love the ability that procs when he kills something it's just like hey you can't do a mission objectives you're too scared that the, the fact that he yeah. could fight twice with consolidating in the middle and then also scare somebody so hard that they can't contest something means he could like completely shut down three enemies from scoring in a single activation. Yeah. And he's a perfect perfect person to give the no rerolls or the the grizzly trophy. He, I, I I think I love giving him the Yeah, I, I do give him the skin or the the Grizzly trophy and I got five attacks. If you're only getting one or two, I'll parry, take no damage, and then finish the job. Yeah, the Nemesis Claw definitely have kind of like upgraded versions of the Legionary, but they lose some stuff in response. You know, the flexibility of the marks is definitely felt when you're playing Legionary, especially as Jason calls out that they can't ignore APL modifiers. Mm -hmm. Have you ever run into a player trying to mass stun grenades against your your Nemesis Claw and how have you dealt with it? Or has it just been a thing that hasn't popped up yet in the local meta and someone in Texas should play it against you? Um, I, I haven't seen the mass a or the mass stun things come up. I've seen the stun thing come up, and it was a very interesting experience because you, you think elites like, oh, we always have tools to negate APL modifications. Um, I was playing against Hearthkin the other the other day, and uh the dozer had charged in on my leader who was just safely in cover getting in midnight clad feeling safe as can be got charged got pushed into the open taking three mortal wounds and then i got stunned um his heavy gunner had a field day on on top just like all right looks like you're a white right wide in the open and then the dozer ended up charging an a different operative and I actually managed to kill that operative um <laughs> I, I i don't know what happened in in that role but it was a uh, scary to see happen yeah i think one of the interesting meta choices right now is that hearthkid and salvagers actually have pretty good matchups against elites across the board purely because you can take p1 and mass and you can almost reliably always have it so as the game goes on, their gunners just get better and better with their normals to crit retains. Yeah. And I, they I, have good AP and they have three APL. So if you want to take it to a mid great mid round fight with the Hearthkin Salvagers, they've got lethal five up power knife, power plasma knives, 
And uh, it can be really rough for a 12 wound operative when your opponents all got three, five lethal five weapons. Yeah, they like to be in that six inch range, which just magically shuts off in midnight clad. And it, it takes but it only takes one guy to turn it off for most of my team. Um, and they they want to be close anyways. So within six inches, get plus one a hit, get some nice little reroll shenanigans. Um, and suddenly that AP one gun looks a lot more threatening. Oh, and you know what? I haven't even thought about. Uh, so, yeah, because when one model gets close enough, it shuts off in Midnight Clad, and that will also shut off the Super Conceal, right? Yeah, yeah, so Midnight... Yeah, that's part of the condition of Midnight Clad, is Yeah, so someone could get close, and then you can shoot them from a vantage point anyways. Yeah, and then if you got the no- or Ignore Obscuring token or the high... R- the, the Rotary Cannon, they're... They got full eyes on you. Pretty spooky. It's a good, uh, a good note for people who are struggling against the Nemesis Claw. Make sure that all three have to be met, right? It's got to have a conceal order. And the conceal order is treated there as if it, you know, ignored vantage points or other rules. Mm-hmm. And then you got to be within heavy or light terrain or underneath shadow. And then you got to be more than six inches away so just like void dancers before them once people get within six or in- inches of your operatives some of your abilities go away and it can lead to some very rude plays right yeah because it's just six inches invisible too so you don't have to be able to shoot them but if you've got an uh, if you've got a spotter within six inches it does suddenly remove the umbral shroud which is good counterplay good positional counterplay and for a player who's used to playing far soccer kinban positional counterplay is probably a big part of your bread and butter yeah uh, at, at dallas i played against night lord so I, I i knew what to expect uh going into the team um it, in san antonio at least on our side we play with uh, no doors most of the time on octarius Ooh, okay uh it's a little a little controversial i know um but at Dallas, it was doors on, obviously. Um, fun plays. Dogs, body block a door. They're at, they they have to fight. If they want to get past, they're going to have to fight a dog. Um, but that's exactly where I want them to be anyways. Just out in the open with next to fighting a dog. Nice. Yeah, I mean, one of the powerful abilities for the far stalkers, if you can rig it up properly, is the dogs are allowed to counter charge people. So a dog blocking a door and then a more vulnerable operative at the edge of an Octarius piece, your opponent can think, oh, I can go charge this guy. And then suddenly a dog appears and it yaps at your opponent and forces you to fight the dog. Yeah, one of the things that I wish were to be added there is to be able to do it from conceal, sort of like uh, how Corsairs can do it. Um because I want to play my defensive game, but putting out a dog on an engage just is asking for trouble since they know it's going to either recover an item or something along those lines. Um, but putting it like <clears throat> in a safe position like that, uh, and you can put your other friendly operatives in a way that if they are ever going to be charged, they have to go right next to the dog. Um, that, and that's a situation that I love. Yeah, it's something I've tried to set up a couple times. It is an interesting position as far as being a competitive player because it is a trap and your opponent might not understand why that trap is happening intuitively. So how do you approach those situations as a competitive player? Do you let people just get caught by the bad tempered crew hound or do you explain things up front and then when your opponent is trying to do it, you remind them? Um, I, I'm, I'm that type of player who just constantly reminds you like, uh, I know I know crew aren't the most popular team and not a lot of play, but people have that experience to play against them. And I never want to win by, oh, gotcha. Um, <clears throat> I, I clearly let the, my opponent know, like, hey, if you're going to charge, my, I'll, my dog is going to be able to counter charge. So before they're picking up their model, they, they will know, have to keep that in mind. Um, sure, it sort of ruins my trap, my bait, or anything, but sometimes... If they want to continue moving up the board, they're going to have to make that play anyways. Yeah, because um, sometimes you, you it like, works out. Yeah, if you really like have a a pincer, like a really good defensive setup there, it's totally fine if they know about the trap because you just like get the position that you want anyways. Yeah, and so at the end of the day, they're either going to take the bait or they're just going to have to play around it and do something that they're not going to that they might not like. They might have another play that they might be able to do, but 
I'm forcing them to reconsider. Um, yeah. And it usually pays off to my benefit. Yeah. Um, you had also mentioned that you've got quite a few people playing Mandrakes in your area and that that's been a fun matchup for Farstalkers. I'm curious what the tech and some of the specifics there are. Yeah, so Mandrakes, uh, day one of Dallas, I did Hyrotech, Mandrakes, Hyrotech, Mandrakes. Um, so it was fun to get that experience. Um, Mandrakes are a tricky team because they also like to play a little more defensively, but their defensively is semi-aggressive. Semi They're moving all their people up the board as fast as they can. Um, have, staying in cover, getting that invulnerable save. Um, their punch is stronger than my punch. Um, so I've, I've, I found it where I can't really do implant reliably because I really need as much chip damage as I can. Because um, if they're going to fight first, uh, they have the opportunity to fight first. Um, they have uh, rending, they have blast, they have a lot of tools that sort of prevent me from being as defensive as I want, so it's, I'm forced to take a more aggressive position to be able to do some sort of counter punch. Um, I I think they got a lot of tools that really hurt the crew. Um, the shadow, their shadow passage, if they use it with their shadow weaver, they can get a lot of people up the board. Um, and if I'm able to shut that down by smooth dashing a guy uh, to the halfway point of the board to just keep eyes on that position, that's not a sacrifice I want to make because uh, they have the tools to take that person down it for free, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I'm also curious. Do you take the? Did you take the Skinner the the AP two? flamer against the mandrakes or did you is that one where you would switch it up that's the that's the idea that i've that i've heard that i've talked about um i didn't do it uh just because i still want to put that threat um if they're outside of outside of uh shadow it's they're still rolling fives so not super great to be saving on um <clears throat> and it uh, the reason that I wanted to take it was it's still six attacks on twos. Um, if it's if it's the person called a kill, I'm rerolling those ones. Um, so at the end at the end of it, damage should be getting through, uh, which is what I need to happen. Yeah, ultimately, like the one of the best tools against a four up invulnerable save is just more attacks. So that does that does make a lot of sense. Yeah, I, 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 <clears throat> because he's also just a normal crew warrior. On top of that, so there's, there, there's no reason for me to drop him and take another warrior unless I really wanted the GA2, which I don't think I need. Yeah, probably not. Um, except for, like, I don't know, the only reason... Do you ever take two crew warriors? Um, I think on Into the Dark, it's more likely that you need... that you would want to take it. Uh, so you can do... If, if you have them all in the same room, or on the same side, you can have one guy move, open that door, and have the other one charge and fight something on the other side and tie it up. Um, I I haven't done that because I like my dogs too much and the abilities that, that it has. Yeah, so. that makes a lot of sense. Like, the only thing I was thinking about, the reason to take two warriors would be something like um, on loot, if you can park them both and then you can poach one and then one of them you just like already contested, then like, oh, yeah, right yeah. off the bat you could double loot the middle and most likely take a 4-2 with that, um, like a 4-2 early. But that's also just, like, pretty aggressive and not necessarily the way to play crew. Yeah, I, I was just talking to somebody the other day. Is, um, <clears throat> they were trying to figure out what team suited their needs, and um, <clears throat> they were just, like, asking for recommendations. And I was just, like, saying, hey, pick something to your that, like, that fits your play style. Um, you can play different... Er, uh, fits your play style... And then on top of that, feels right to you. Um, and I was saying, like, hey, there there are ploys that allow Kroot to be aggressive. Um, allows you to get balanced and heavy. It's a ploy I've never done. 
um, because I don't want to play that way. I'd rather be the def- the more defensive aspect of Crute. Yeah, unfortunately, I think Farstalker Kinban do suffer some lethality issues as far as sculpting your overall game plan. You're okay in melee, you're decent in shooting, but you're not very reliable because you have only, I think, six reasonable shooters, and some of them are short range, some of them are mm-hmm. long range. So you're not really able to output firepower in the same way that people like Castrican or Pathfinders or Veteran Guard yeah. can. But your big benefit is that you can do all the game plans a little bit. So when you play against someone who's good at shooting, you can pivot into more of a melee-centric team because four attacks on threes, three, four, probably isn't going to kill a seven-wound operative, but the seven-wound operative is definitely not going to beat you in combat. Yeah. And then when you come up against all melee teams, shooting's not great, but if you're shooting against Felgor, your shooting will probably frenzy a Felgor too as they hit your lines, which means that defensively, you can maybe find a crit in your melee step and survive. Yeah, I, that, that's why I like to call them the jack of, jack of all trades is they're not great at any one of those specific things, but it's enough to flex. Uh, so just like you said, it's like if I need early shooting, I have the operative to be able to, to get early shots off and then focus melee in the late game. Or if I just need to move my melee guys, um, even my warrior, it's with the <clears throat> with the one extra attack with the ploy turned on. That's four attacks on three, three, four. Um, not super scary, but that's going to be, if I get a, if I roll a crit, it's a four damage on an elite or it's, uh, th- uh, six, seven damage on a normal guy. Yeah. It's enough to parry out if people try to do something aggressive to you and generally against seven wound operatives over two attack steps, you'll all pretty much always get them. Whereas if you had three attacks, <coughs> you might not even finish a dude in two attack steps. You yeah. Know? And there are situations where I probably just keep the guy alive just so I can stay in combat and be a, be even safer. Yeah, being able to hide in combat is pretty nice. Obviously, one of the big tools that the crew get to play with is floating APL, something that the Hernkin Jaeger are about to get. You've got trophies. You can take up to three of them. Do you have operatives that you pretty much always give a trophy to? And in what situations are you popping that important trophy on that VIP? So... I like to give trophies out to the uh, the archer and the sniper, um, so I don't have to rely on the <clears throat> on the comms. Comms usually ends up taking a central position, anyways, just in case I I have the time where I don't need to immediately need that third APL, or I can set up for next turn. Um, but sniper love giving it too, so I can do it to get the dash, get the turn on his. Uh, silent, lethal 5-up, ignore obscuring, and then make the shot. The bow, I love giving it to him in both situations on Into the Dark and on Open Board. Um, if it's a horde on Into the Dark, I get to move, dash, splash arrow, I get the lethal 5-up anyways. Or move 6 inches, turn, energize it for the lethal 5-up, and shoot my 4-5 AP1 arrow. Um, those are <clears throat> very easy to maneuver and I don't, and if I don't get the shot, then that's fine. I'll save it for another turn on into the dark. I'm looking at, tr- I, I've been trying, a uh, the grizzly trophy on the, on the heavy gunner for the situations that come up where I need to open a door and move into a room. Um, that's six extra inches that I can, that I can abuse. And it comes in clutch. I'm if somebody else is opening that door, even better. Um, but that's a moving a moving a open door for them. Uh, I'll be happy to take that trade. Um, but it really lets me play into the plan where I don't really want to open the door unless I have to. Um, and then otherwise, turn one, that comms is looking to see where he can dish out a an extra move dash if it's uh, secure. Maybe they can get on one of the further objectives or get one that's um, uh, that opponent's already claimed. Um, oh, what I also like to do is give the plus one APL bonus from the comms to the Pistolier so that he can be in a really good position to potentially get his six inch shot, uh, his quick draw ability to proc. Uh, and if I get an initiative, I can just dash him and double shoot something. 
I normally just take the two Grizzly trophies so that I can flex around with um, AP one shots and the Ritual Blade. All right, so basically you're using the Ritual Blade on the Crew Kill Broker because that way you get four or five melee instead of three, four melee, making him way more reliable at dealing with all sorts of things. I'm sure there are going to be matches where maybe the f- three, four is fine. You know, matches where maybe you're not going to be killing an elite anyways, so you take another piercing shot to try to crack armor, or is that not a thing that you found to do? Because uh, I think when I've played, I've generally elected to go two trophies, ritual blade, and meat over the other piercing shots, and I've just left the piercing shots on the blooded operative. Is it the blooded operative? Cold blood. On the cold blood? Uh, yeah, the, the, the guy who takes crits as normals, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... Or have you not found that meat is very good because it's it's happening too late? The way that meat works, if it was worded differently, I would probably want to use it more because it's when that operative is activated. Um, they more often than not, people are going to try to kill my my uh, specialist all at once. Uh, if he has a meat, then that's just a wasted equipment. If it was something where I could just use it in the during my activation. It would be so much better because then I would be able to play play that more aggressive uh, charge fight, uh, heal back up to uh, hopefully around hopefully full. Uh, but that's not the case, and so it's 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 not what I like to take. Um, where I've seen it be super efficient is on the cold blood because he can take, um, say if it's a bolt gun, he can survive two crits. Um, very easily and that's the only place where I've actually seen it be super efficient um, as for the ritual blade I, yeah I take it into into the elites just in case if I if I don't think that I can get it done with shooting more often than not I don't really need to have him be the one charging in um, but it's nice to have it just in case I love taking it into elf teams they like to be very tricksy move up the board uh if they're going to be taking out my leader my leader's got a standing shot to just two hit them um but i love piercing shot on the pistolier i can target something with ap1 um will have lethal five up balanced if it's my call to kill person i'm re-rolling the ones hitting on threes um it's very reliable, and so if I'm able to just do that to a, if it's a space marine, that space marine should be w- pretty wounded at the end of that shot. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, it can very easily kill a um, a ten wound operative who's saving on around four to five, and then I got an extra shot if it just in case. Otherwise, I send that shot elsewhere. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's the team's fun. It's got a lot of tools and being able to flex around is definitely one of the fun things that the team is good at. One of the fun things that I've been noodling around with conceptually when you play against Nemesis Claw next time is just taking mass toxin shots because you'll have you'll have six <laughs> guys who can stun a Marine. And oh, that would yeah. be pretty funny. Oh, I th- Whether I it would be a good it. idea, I don't know if it's a good idea, but it does sound hilarious. Hey, when you're when you're when they're only two op, two APL or two APL model, they are significantly less scary. They're they're not charge fighting shooting. They're not charge fighting additional charge fight. Um, they're very handicapped once they're two APL. Yeah, and they can't even like charge and score because they'll like not even control objectives. <laughs> True, actually. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, that was uh, one of the last games that I tried to play with Nemesis Claw. Um, I was playing against Blades of Cain, and the Banshees were just stunning everybody. And I was like, I guess I just lose. Yeah, uh, the lethal shots just on uh or the toxic shot. It's a lethal five up too. I don't care about the two two damages. Like I just. I'm just rolling for a five right now. Um, and, and once that happens, it's like, all right, somebody else just. Someone else come and kill this. Yeah. Someone yeah. else come and kill this Marine. 
<laughs> yeah, the cool thing is, like, as a pivot strategy, you know, you can use call to kill, you can give ceaseless to all of your guys taking these toxin shots, and then as you shoot, you're like, well, you know, I've got four attacks or five attacks effectively, depending on how your dice roll out, and all you need is the one stun to, like, stall a marine out for an entire turn, and because you've got all of these other ways to score points, if you can just slow their game plan down and play keep away, you might be able to win yeah, that Yeah, just essentially just, they're going to be stuck on their side of the board, either... Either focusing on getting points or taking making kills. Both of those yeah. are going to play out to me because I'm just going to be on top yeah. of their objectives and maybe it, it might be a 5 1 turn or 10. Well, not, yeah. not actual. You, five, you, could, but, you could even push yeah. it a little bit further by taking a photon grenade on the Kroot kill broker. It's not very reliable, but if you're, if for whatever reason a far soccer player wanted to try this against exactly Nemesis Claw <laughs> or Gellerpox, because these are strategies that work against two APL melee centric yeah. teams. You know, you pull call the kill and their most important operative. You've got ceaseless there. You've got your toxin shots. And then photon grenade for anyone who's never looked at it basically says your opponent has a six inch charge if you can pull it off. It, so I, being I able to do that, grenade, but uh, I, I take it on oh, the you case do take that it, it happens. Um, oh, I've never, I, I, I I've never met a player who has actually used I, the really? pulse car line. So yeah, well, I just, right. you know, you can only do it once a game. So the photon grenade has never really been in contention for me. I've only talked about it in exactly the context <laughs> of playing Compendium Tau. I think two <laughs> podcast episodes ago. So with a, uh, so his shooting options aren't like super great. Uh, two of them hit on fours, and then you have the crew rifle, which hits on threes. Um, I never really want to shoot with him, anyways. Because uh, once I, once he's dead, he's gonna lose. I lose a bunch of rebolts, um, or a potential. Um, the photon grenade, I love trying to do. I understand that it's never gonna happen. Um, um, it it very rarely happens, especially it's on the time that up. I need it yeah, to happen. It's a, yeah, when you you need it, it's a four up or a three up, which is not great. And if it's on a three up, it's probably because you're within six inches of them which means that they can still charge you they're still charging anyways yeah so i i love it doing it because i'll keep my leader towards the back as long as possible and then move him up to charge um but i'll just move him out it's just so he has visuals on it it's like yeah i got nothing else to do with him i'm not gonna put him on the objective just in case and if it happens i'm awesome that's awesome but uh if it does it all right i just lost an apl i don't i don't really care that much uh, I would rather have the opportunity to use it than not have the opportunity. Interesting. And this is because you're using your leader primarily as a call to kill reroll piece. So having an extra action that you can do outside of just yeah. being defensive and hiding gives you something I, useful. I for treat him as support. Um, yeah. And if he's got the ritual blade, then he's going to he's got the potential to be aggressive. Um, that doesn't. The, the his aggressiveness doesn't really equate when he's sh shooting. I don't think it's that impressive. Um, but if people are on my in my territory, as I, I I need to address that because I need to maintain control of my objectives and my side of the board uh, for my for my points. And if there's somebody on my side, he can reliably get a lot of damage in. All right. So you mentioned a couple of tournaments you've got coming up. You know, I got to do the the call out for the New York Open. It'll be happening October 26, 27 in New York. We'll have tickets up hopefully sometime this month. But any shout out the other Texas tournaments here while listeners are listening. Yeah, of course. Uh, so we got the Lone Star Open coming up. That's uh, the big one in Dallas. Uh, that is July... Oh, okay, so it's uh, it is the twentieth and the twenty-first. Twentieth and the twenty-first. All right, uh, yeah, as that's what Frontline Gaming says. So as long as they're accurate, then we're good to go. And um, yeah, I got a work trip coming up that week, and so hope we're I'm I'm seeing what's in the books because I'd love to be able to attend. Um, we have uh, I know I think College Station is having a compendium only tournament happening. Um, <clears throat> I think sometime this next, this month or next month um, sounds super fun. Uh, if people are able to attend, I would highly encourage uh, those Texas folks to make that effort because a uh, compendium team only teams sounds like a lot of fun. 
in our in our narrative, anybody doing a compendium team, they get extra bonuses uh, for doing that. Uh, let's yeah, see. That's fun. Uh, if you are you going to play in the compendium only? Uh, I don't think I'll be able to make it to that one. If you did, what team would you play? Um, I'd I'd probably take a compendium crew. <laughs> I love uh, I love what they got going on. You have a crew um, talks. Crew talks, carry operative. Love it. I wish we had one. Yeah, but it yeah it would probably be between a crew or a normal Tau Empire. The I love. When when it was just Compendium, I, that's the first team that I started playing with. Is stealth suits were awesome. I love what they were able to do. Just a little bit too few AP for them to be functional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they were fun though. While, while it lasted, yeah, they're neat. They're neat. <laughs> yeah, for anyone interested in playing Compendium Tau, listen to the talons episode and i think somewhere in the middle there's a specific call out for how to play compendium tau especially with two stealth suits um i guess the other call out is we've got the goonhammer open early july we've got a 300 dollars prize pot for first place and a golden ticket to the world championships for anyone local to the northeast area and listening we would love to see you and there will be prizes for first second third and best painted but Alexander, thanks for coming by, talking up the crew. One of my favorite teams is just a bit too much of a knife edge as far as my desire to play them with very little practice. But excited yeah. to hear your successes. Of course, that's a team I love. It's a team I don't recommend all that much just because of that reason. It's a it's a tricky team to really to really master. Um, and it, it's I think it's got a figure play style. Um, but no, yeah, I appreciate you guys having me out. It's been super awesome chatting with you, and uh, yeah, it was super nice to see you again, Travis. Yeah, thanks for coming on, and thank you listeners for listening until the end. 